turn in our Bibles today to Romans 4, and uh, we're going to be talking about the new you. It's just great to see everybody here on this wonderful May sunny morning. All right. Now, yeah. The kids uh, were at Limitless. Uh, the youth were at Limitless last night. Just had a powerful time. Tremendous time there in Malala. And uh, just uh, great to have them back. And uh, But hey, everybody, let's uh, turn in our Bibles uh, to... Uh, Romans 4, but uh, before that, I'm going to read a few other scriptures, and then we're going to go into it here. All right, here we go. And so we're continuing this series on the new you, and looking at in the middle of Romans, and uh, from the book of Romans, and we've looked at uh, grace, and w- that that is uh, God's favor and force uh, working in you. Every one of us, we don't deserve God's grace. It is unmerited, undeserved, and God, in his wonderful love, looks at each and every one of us, and he, he uh, says, hey, it's available through Jesus Christ. But as well as that, it is, a, uh, it is the force. It is a, a power, uh, an empowerment of the Lord, and a, a divine enablement to do what is godly, what is right. It, it just does, uh, sin may remain, but it doesn't, it doesn't reign anymore. In other words, the power, the influence of sin doesn't have the control over our life. We may be tempted. We may experience uh, Satan attacks, satanic attacks on our life. But the grace of God comes into our life. And it, it, uh, where grace reigns, sin wanes. And there's a moving away from those things. It doesn't just give us just a freedom to do whatever we please or whatever we want to. It's working to make us more like Jesus on a daily basis. And that is the the power of God's uh, beautiful grace in our life. But we also talked about taking steps of obedience and how each one of us, it's just not just uh, shazam and everything is changed in our life. Even though there is a transformation that does take place, there also needs to be a formation. And and with that formation is steps of obedience where we choose and respond to the Lord and allow his grace to work in our life. And little by little, there's changes that keep on taking place in our life, uh, making us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. But today we're going to be looking at the area of faith. And that's uh, another key component uh, along with grace and obedience. Uh, we're going to be looking at the area of faith. Hebrews 11.1, one, uh, popular verse, everybody pretty well knows it, is now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's a good verse. If you don't have that underlined in your Bible, it's a good one to underline. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you go into Burgerville and you buy a hamburger and a shake and you go in there, uh, the, what Burgerville does is they give you these tags and it has a number tag. And now you can go back into Burgerville after COVID and you go in there and you get your coffee shake and uh, your burger, double with cheese, type with no mayo, no onions. Okay, and you get, get those things and you, you get this number, you get this tag. What that tag is with the number after you've paid for it, it is uh, the substance of things hoped for, the, the evidence of things not seen. There, there is something in there that says, hey, I am going to get that burger and that shake. And uh, that is really what faith is. All of a sudden, and it's uh, primarily on two areas. It is the promises of God and the character of God. When you have the promises of God based upon the character of God, and you say, hey, I now have something. I am holding a tag in my hand, and I have this in my hand, and I am believing that I am going to receive. You believe, you receive. You doubt, you go without. You just get, take, you take that, and you take a hold of that. Now, faith is the currency of heaven. It is the key that unlocks and opens the door uh, for things in the the spiritual realm. If you were to think of a pipeline, and you're thinking uh, in that pipeline, instead of flowing oil, is flowing the grace of God moving in our life, and and we're in Christ uh, with this pipeline. 
there are valves that you have to open to release uh, that flow of grace in your life. And that is faith. That is where faith comes in. And you, you begin to open up and it allows the things of the Spirit, allows the things of grace, it allows the, the enablement of the Lord working in our life. It is uh, trusting and believing the Lord uh, for who he is. So the interconnection between these two things where the word of God and the character of God. So we have these uh, common verses, Romans 10, 17. We have, uh, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or a word from God. It is a quickened word to our spirit, to our heart, to our life. And as we hear that, there is something that rises within us. Hey, I need to respond to this word that God is speaking to me. So faith is built up. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by a word from God, responding to the word of God. And then uh, Hebrews 11.6, another famous verse. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he, he is. That is who God is, his character of, of who he is. And that he is a rewarder of all those who seek him. God is a rewarder. Again, faith is that, that currency. It's, it's having a word from God, and it's also believing in the character of God, Mesh together, responding, and it's, it's a faith transaction that takes place at that point. And there is, God is saying, hey, when I have that combination, the word and also my character going hand in hand together, uh, there is a faith transaction that takes place. And it's, it's something that connects with the Lord, and he says, hey, I will reward that person. I will reward that individual. I will bless that person uh, with that exchange of faith. No faith, no reward. It's like it's shut, shut off. Um, so Romans 1.17 says these words. It says, for in, in it... The righteousness in it, which is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, okay? It isn't a stagnant faith, okay? It's not just a one-time faith. It is an increasing faith. It is a growing faith. It's moving away from just a dormancy. There is a, something within us that is expanding and enlarging each and every one of us in our faith, that we're growing. The just shall live by faith. That there would be this characteristic that would be over each and every one of us, that we would be a people of faith. The uh, word live here is a, a word zoe, and which is the divine quality of life. And th there's something where each and one of us are looking for the abundant life in our, in our own personal lives. What happens there is as we put our faith, as we put our confidence and trust in the Lord, and we're, you know, we've been trying other things, we've been doing other things, we have that first response and we say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you from this point on. I'm going to put my trust in you, my confidence in you. I'm going to believe in you and not in myself. And you begin to live that life. You know, it opens up that whole realm of the abundant life that God promises in his word, the just, that's the righteous, that is us who believe in Jesus shall be, should be an ongoing, growing faith. It, each and every one of us, it should be, uh, there should be something living and active happening in each one of us. It shouldn't just get stagnant. It shouldn't just get stale in our life. There should be something that is, that is of an increasing measure that is taking place in our life, making us more and more like Jesus, and also in our uh, reactions and actions with other people. There needs to be a growing faith. Everybody say, the just shall live by faith. All right. All right. Okay, let's uh, stand up, okay? Let's stand up for the Word of God. Now, uh, turn to your neighbor and say, good morning. Welcome to Rock Point. Turn, turn around and actually, actually do about two or three people, okay? You know, just, you just got to say hi to somebody, okay? Tell them they're looking good. 
Welcome our friends from Holland. We have some friends from Holland over here. And uh, it's great to have them here. Praise the Lord. It's good to have guests and visitors. Here we go. All right, here we're going to read the scripture. Everybody, let's uh, look, up, look ahead here. Uh, Romans 4.16. Here we go. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scripture means when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abram believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God has said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abram never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abram's faith, God counted him as righteous. God bless you. You may be seated. So Abraham gets a promise at approximately the age of 75 years of age. And he says, hey, your name is no longer going to be Abram. It is now going to be, which is uh, father that he will be Abraham, which is the picture of a father of many uh, nations, or the father of many, and that he was going to be, a, the, his descendants would be heir to the promises of God's covenant, and his, uh, this wouldn't come from his household, it, would, it wouldn't come from a hired person in his family, but it would be uh, straight from his loins. And so you think of this for a second, okay, Abram, is a hundred years old, okay? His wife is in the beginning of her, she's a young 90, okay? She, she's a young 90, okay? How many would want to be starting a family at a hundred years old? You know, and we think of this on Abraham, you know, he is dead, basically. He's dead, and Sarah's womb is barren. There, there's not enough Viagra in the world. That, that is gonna, that, that's going to help Abraham right here, okay? He, he, it is, he's, it's dormant, okay? You are in a helpless situation, a helpless so, to bring something to life. There was nothing, okay, you with me? There is nothing in the natural that could have transformed and changed that situation at this point. He was helpless. And at that point, in, when he was 75 years old, he gets a promise from God. This thing is dead. I am dead. I'm, I'm getting a promise from God that I'm just not going to be a father, but I'm going to be the father of many. Okay? What do I do with that word from God? Okay, so he takes this promise, and in these, these lines we're reading, it says, God told him. He believed in God who brings the dead back to life. There was no reason to hope, but Abraham kept hoping, for God had said to him. Then Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise to his life to bring glory to God. He believed that God is able, that God could do it. He believed there. And then there's those lines that are there. It says, Abraham kept on hoping. He had a, a confident expectation that there was good, 
that he didn't believe, his faith didn't weaken, it didn't lose its intensity, he, he never wavered, it, ne- it was a, a, like an expressing of discouragement and disapproval, like, hey, God's never going to show up in my life, you know, there, and he just, he believed the promises, and it says his faith grew stronger, it developed, it, it became, became more and more. And there he is. He's putting his trust in God, in the promise of God. And he personally has to take the faith. Hey, I've received that tag. I've got that number. I have the promise of God for my life. And the Bible says it was accounted to him for righteousness. The the word there is a picture of all of a sudden he received abundance. He was in a place of bankruptcy, and then all of a sudden there was this divine exchange that took place, and he received the abundance of what God could only give. And that's what God comes to each and every one of us. Maybe you're here, and you do not have a personal faith with Jesus Christ. You are at a place right now where you can receive the abundance of God by acknowledging him and saying, Jesus, I need you in my life. But on the ongoing basis in each and every one of our lives, we need to say, hey, Lord, I have really nothing to offer except I believe your promise. I trust your promise in my life. That is faith, and I respond to that. And even though there might be a waiting stage, even though there might be delay in seeing that promise fulfilled in my life, Lord, I trust you and I believe that you can do impossible things and you can turn this around and it was accounted to him. There's a time where, hey, there's a transfer, a bank transfer into his account of reward. God is a rewarder. He owes no man anything. He is a, everybody turn to your neighbor, say, God is a rewarder. All right. You know, I, I want to hit uh, four things today, and I, I want to take it out of the gospel of uh, Matthew, and it's talking about OU of little faith, OU of little faith. And the idea here of having little faith is like it is immature faith. It is under, underdeveloped faith. It isn't that you don't have faith, but the Lord wants each and every one of us in the school of discipleship that we are all in. We, God, Jesus is going to walk us through certain circumstances and situations, each and every one in our lives, and he's going to say, hey, how are you going to respond in this situation? How are you going to take my word, my promises that I'm giving you and in this situation, how are you going to respond to them in this, these areas? And he will, t- he will test us in those areas to bring us more into a place of maturity and development. So here, here are these four things that I want to hit this morning. The first one is worry. Worry. Matthew 6, we have this story. It goes that. Matthew 6, 30, uh, 31, this is in the uh, Sermon on the Mountain, and Jesus is talking. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear. Worry uh, is, comes, uh, the word worry comes from the old German word to strangle, to strangle. And it is an inward, anxious, emotional, mental strangulation, okay? Wor- worry is our life being divided and choked by inward fears. It is, you know, worry is a, a form of atheism. Okay, and you say, now, I know that's a little tough and a little challenging to think of that, but, uh, you know, the worrier doesn't think, I'm, I'm not an atheist by any means, but what it does is here in these, this Beatitudes, God is saying, hey, there, there's a father, and a father who's watching over you, 
and he's a good, good father. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, he's a good, good father, okay? And he's watching over us. He cares for us. And the worrier, what he gets caught on is an inner focus on oneself, some, their own emotions, and they trust. They're, they're so worried about the, the, the future, they fail to realize that they, are, they serve a God who is present, who is a God who is able, a God who will supply for you, a God who cares for you, a Father that loves you, who is watching over you, and there is a God who cares about you. That, how many know the Lord will not forsake us? He, he will not leave us. He's not going to leave you in a lurch and just say, hey, oh, I'm going to pull the plug on them. Oh, yeah. You know, they're on their, they're on their own on this one. Oh, go, oh yeah, they're, they're good, not going to have anything. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to give them groceries anymore, you know, and they're not going to have this and that. Oh, I just want to do that to them. That, that is not the heart of the Father. You know, we, we might be going into a bear market. We might have wars going around us in the world. We might have or coming out of the COVID season and everything. And there's something, you might be dealing with personal things in your family that you are fretting about. But th those things can just be take, uh, in, put you into internal knots within your stomach. But you need to understand, you have a caring loving, heavenly Father over your life. And it is in those times, oh, little, uh, you of little faith, we need to just in those times, just like, you know, when those thoughts begin just to take over and just really run us over, because that's what they try to do. They just try to run us over and just like, stop it, stop it. I trust Jesus. I trust the Father. He is going to take care of me through the midst of it all. I believe in his promises to my life. And one thing he is commanding me to do right here is do not worry. I've got this. And it's in those times where we're just feeling that, that pinch on our life. Jesus, I, I turn this over to you. Jesus, it's going to be okay. And we have to say it on a regular basis. When you're, the, the battle of the mind, it, you know, the battles between the ears, people. And it's in those times we just got to say, God, I trust you. Okay, here's the second one. Second one, close like the first. Here's what it is. Fear. Fears. Matthew 8, 26. But he said to them, this is Jesus talking. Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he re arose and rebu rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. You know, uh, this story here, of course, is the story of uh, Jesus uh, with the disciples going across the Sea of Galilee on, on a boat, and they're, they're heading off, going to the other side of the sea, and all of a sudden there is a great tempest. There is a storm. There is a squall that happens on the, the Sea of Galilee, and it's tossing that little fishing boat all over the place. And the disciples on that boat say, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? We're dying on here. And, and, and Jesus is sleeping on the boat. How many have ever felt Jesus is sleeping? You know, Jesus, come on. Where are you in this? And finally, they wake up Jesus. Jesus gets up and he says these words in a groggy voice. He says, but he said to them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose. He gets up. Shouldn't stand in a boat, but Jesus did. Okay. He, he rose and he re rebuked the wind. You know, the, the word here for rebuke is actually the same word that they used in other places in the gospel to rebuke a demon. He's like, Jesus says, so all of a sudden stands up and he says, right now, in the name of Jesus, oh, I am Jesus, right now, I rebuke this thing right now, be, be still. There, hey, Jesus isn't denying that each and every one of us go through storms. 
There is a reality that we, do, we face those things. There, there are things, people with their, their marriages, people with uh, financial situations, there's different areas of people have serious issues. Jesus isn't saying there, there aren't great storms in our life. But at that point, there is a point where we need to take an authority in Jesus' name. Lord, I am coming against this. I remember one time being in Belize. We're doing an outreach in a northern area of Belize that hadn't had much evangelism. And um, it was a scene. We're in this square. It was like a scene from Agatha Christie's uh, book or movie, The Birds. And there were just like birds everywhere. It's like, wh here we're trying to witness and evangelize and reach people for Jesus Christ. And all these birds just flocking all, all around us. And finally, we, you know, it was, we, I was a youth pastor at that time. Right in that square, it's just like, hey, we take authority over all the noise and the distractions that are going on right now. The birds are silent. Right in, that, right in that square. You know, I know sometimes uh, Karen and I were coming into a Sunday as pastors, and it's like, I mean, it's like things are happening. Uh, circumstances there, relational things there, family things over here and there. And it's like, we just look at each other and we just smile. It's going to be a good Sunday. You know? <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because Jesus is going to show up. There's sometimes there are things... People that we experience, demonic forces that want to work against different areas of our life, where it just try to take a hold of us with fears, overtaking our life. Honestly, people, in the name of Jesus, I come against those things. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but a love and power and sound mind. He's given you an authority over those areas. Everybody say amen to that one. And, and there's a great calm. Okay, here's the next one is doubt. Doubt. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? And so this story is... Uh, Jesus sends the disciples across again, the Sea of Galilee, and he tells them to go before him. Jesus goes up to a mountain. He starts praying, and he sees the disciples on the sea, and they're again in another storm, and uh, they're facing it. And Jesus decides in the middle of the night to start walking across the sea, and he comes across there, and uh, the, uh, he comes to Peter, and Peter says, If it is you... Command me to come. Command me to come. At which point Jesus says, come. And Peter steps out of the boat. He walks out of the boat and begins walking towards Jesus. And he sees the boisterous wind, however you see the boisterous wind. He saw the boisterous wind, and all of a sudden he began to doubt, and he begins to sink. At which time Jesus doesn't let him dip three or four times. He grabs his hand right there and he lifts him up right there. And he asks him, hey, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You're convinced of something, then you hesitated, you questioned, I better think this over, you reasoned, you sunk. You know, Doubt is questioning what you believe. Unbelief, there, there's a distinction, okay, between doubt and unbelief. Unbelief is de determined refusal to believe. Doubt is a struggle faced by the believer. Unbelief is a condition of the unbeliever. And there is, there is a distinction. And, and many times in our Christian uh, walk and our life, there are times, hey, Lord, what is going on? There are questions that rise in our heart, but, and we're wondering, God, what, is, what in the world is going on? Doubt limits God's working in our life. Doubt doubts that God could do something through little old me. 
You know, there, there are times, you know, we're just thinking, oh, God, you're so amazing. You're so wonderful. You're so great. But I don't believe that you could do anything through me. You know, I, you know, just little old me. But God is looking for opportunities to work in each and every one of our lives where he just points to us and says, hey, I want to work through you. I want to put my hand on you, and I want to show my strength through you, and I want to just demonstrate my power through you, and I want to express all the good things that I have through you that I want to do. And it's like all of a sudden there, there's a, the, Jesus here is encouraging adventurous dis, discipleship. He wants each and every one of us to be bold. He wants us to do, there's promptings that God puts on each one of our hearts. Hey, I want you to talk to that person. I want you to get involved in that ministry. I want to, you to uh, call that person. I want you to do this. And we have those times in our life where God is working on us, stirring on us, moving us out of our comfort zone. And he says, hey, I don't want you to sit there anymore. I want you to get up from your seat, and I want you to jump in and get into this, both of your feet, and just say, God, I am all in. I am 100% going to go for what you're calling for me. I'm, I'm tired of, of sitting in the sidelines. I'm just trying to just to exist my life, just having enough retirement money so I can just die, so I can just have that nice place with a nice dog and beautiful wife that I do have, you know, but I just sitting there, and, and that's all I do. God wants to stir you and challenge you for the divine purpose that he has put on your life. There is, come on people, there, there is a fire that God has put in you. There is a passion that he has given you. He's given you a nation. He's given you places in your heart that you say, God, I need to pour my life into this, and I need to do this. God says, jump out of the boat. Come on, be bold in your spirit. What is God telling you to do? There is something where God wants to move us into out from the doubts. Believe, you receive. Doubt, you go without. Okay? And so, so there is this working in each one of our hearts and spirit where the Lord wants to work out. There are, you know, I, I think of those times... Where, where I've jumped out of the boat. You know, some of the greatest stories of my life are, are the times I've jumped out of the boat. There are, there are ballads to be written. There are songs to be sung. You know, just <laughs> of the good things that God has done through little old me. Can you believe that? Through little old me. You know, when we make ourselves available and we say, Lord, I'm in. I'm in with both feet. I'm jumping in and doing all that you've asked me to do. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say amen, okay? Here's the last one. And for this morning, it's Matthew 16, 8. And it's dealing with reason, reason. Matthew 16, 8. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves? Because you have brought, brought no bread. The, the, the situation here is Jesus had just fed the, the 4,000, okay? There was seven basketfuls left of bread. At that time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees asked Jesus, the religious leaders of the time asked Jesus, hey, we're asking for a sign. Can you give us a sign from heaven after you just fed the 4,000, Okay. They gets into the boat with the disciples. They go to another side, and the disciples forgot bread. And Jesus uh, says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, and beware of the leaven of the Sadducees, which is just liberalism. It's a life without the power of the word of God or the power of, of the living God. Okay, so he says, beware of that. And they're thinking, hey, he's talking about bread. Okay, they're trying to figure it, figure, figure it out. And he, they're saying, Jesus, you're talking about, because you you, we didn't bring any bread. You're, you're, and they're trying to reason this in their own 
mindset, you know, and it's thinking it through, and it's sort of devising their, in their imaginations, preconceived desires, and everything. Rather, here's what can happen, is that we're so used to thinking on a natural plane, through a natural filter, on a natural way of life. We reason things through. You know, the Bible isn't against thinking. Thou sh you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Bible is not against thinking. But when that thinking or the reasoning, hey, I, I, I don't know, I don't know. It just, I'm, I'm, rather than thinking through a spirit of faith, where we have supernatural thinking, what we need is not just a thought life or a thinking life, a thought life. We need a sought life that we are seeking. Lord, what do you say on this matter? God, what are you speaking to my heart? Lord, what are you prompting, okay? We have to make a decision here as a family. Lord, we're, we're, Lord where we're going and everything. Hey, maybe... Maybe it would just be a wise thing as a husband and wife that we just pray about it together. Just join hands and just say, Lord, what would you have us do? Maybe you're making a decision about moving or something like that. Lord, we're praying about this. Just not our own natural way of thinking. Lord, help us. Lord, see the supernatural. What are you doing in this area? Lord, I'm looking at a change of career. Lord, help me to understand, not just through the filter of just natural things, but having a supernatural understanding of seeing things through a spiritual means. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this, these words. It says these, these words, But as it is written... I has not seen nor ear heard. Okay, that is perceptual. That is our five senses. We're always trying to figure it out on the five senses level. Then it says, nor have it entered into the hearts of man. That is conceptual. We're trying to, hey, intellectually figure it out, do it through research, try to put it together together the things which God has prepared for those who love him. There is a realm that is spiritual. It isn't perceptual. It isn't conceptual. It is spiritual. It's not the realm of rationalization. It is the realm of revelation. And every one of us, faith, the realm of faith, walking with the Lord, living in the Spirit, the just living by faith, it is a realm of spiritual revelation. God, what are you saying? What are you saying through your word? Help me to understand it. You can have these roadblocks of always just trying. I, I, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure it out. No, God, what are you saying to me? Not just in my head. Lord, let me take it for, into my heart and also apply it and speak in a word of faith, believing God this is going to be released in my life. I need to follow you, obey you, let the grace of God flow through my life in that area. And it's not just my mental exercises that I do, but it has to be shown to us from above, from the Lord. Amen? Let's have the musicians come at this time. You know, God has a promise. He, uh, pro his promises and his power, you know, his word and his character. And then it leads to persevering faith and creates the divine exchange of, of things going to our account or being imputed to us where we experience from bankruptcy all the way to where we experience all of God having for us. It works through our worries, our fears, our doubts, our reasonings, and developing into mature faith, faith to faith, just shall live by faith. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. Amen.